Beating From Software games without leveling has long been the favourite pastime for Souls players looking for the ultimate satisfaction. Ever since I started making build guides on this channel, I've always wanted to make an RL1 guide. But with Elden Ring, I've always had a bit of a dilemma. Unlike some of the other Souls games, Elden Ring has some weapons that are so strong that, apart from being very low on health, you don't really feel like you're doing a challenge run. Equally, there are more balanced weapons that will force you to engage with and memorise boss movesets in a way that will vastly improve your ability at the game. And I've never really known where I fit into that dilemma. Do I show you how to bully Elden Ring with an OP RL1 weapon? Or do I give you everything you need to start your own journey of getting good? The answer that I eventually came to was yes. So this isn't a follow along playthrough like my other guides. Instead of choosing one particular build and making a guide on it, for this video I will showcase 22 different RL1 builds for each of the main bosses in the game. For every build, I'll show you how to get the weapon, which physic works best, and all of the talismans that you should use, in the order that you should equip them through the playthrough if you don't have all of the slots yet. And I'll of course give you advice on beating the bosses. I'm not going to use any glitches in this playthrough to get early upgrades to keep this as patch proof as possible. And I'm not going to use any weapon that relies on having Godric's Great Rune activated. It really opens up the possibilities, but if you die too many times, you're farming rune arcs between boss attempts. And fuck that. Finally, I try to avoid using weapons that are particularly suited to a specific boss on that boss as I don't want to give you a false impression of what they're capable of in general. This video will arguably be far too long with far too much detail, but hopefully it will serve as a good reference for anyone who wants to do an RL1 run in the future, and maybe even inspire you to start yours now. So make your character, choose the wretch starting class, and grab the golden seed. As usual, if you want to upgrade your weapon, you can follow my standard setup guide. This allows you to get a smithing stone weapon to plus 16 or a somber weapon to plus 6. So everything that I show from here on in will be that level. But of course you can adjust that down if you want a bit more of a scrap with the earlier bosses. First thing I do on an RL1 run is go down to the isolated merchant in the Mistwood to buy a small shield so I can parry Margit. So, time to get started. And for the first build, we're going to do what Miyazaki intended. The club. And for this one, we're going to go grab a talisman and physic combo that you'll be seeing an awful lot of in this run. Head south from the First Church of Marika, through the Mistwood, to grab the spike crack tier by the minor herd tree. Then southwest to the Mistwood ruins to grab the axe talisman. Equip both of these with the strength physic and head up to Margit. Now, I love the club as a weapon, and it was actually one of the top contenders for a full R01 guide. Switching between Sekiro style parries and quick attacks to using charged attacks for staggers and riposts when you have a chance is for me the thing that really makes Elden Ring combat so different from the other Souls games. You can see this in full effect in Ongbal's awesome level one wretch series. For Margit on RL1, I highly recommend parrying. It takes so many variables out of this fight, as he always follows a successful parry with another parryable attack. For our next weapon, head to Castle Morn in Weeping Peninsula, and all the way up to the top to Bonk Edgar for the Banished Knight's Halpert. This comes pre-upgraded to plus eight, so it's a great shout to grab for the early game if you're not scared of Edgar and want to save some smithing stones for later. It's a really nice weapon to use. Great range and spin to win heavy attacks and Ash of War do great physical and posture damage. I didn't bother leveling this, 
So what you're seeing here is how we get it. There isn't much to say about Godric, even at RL1. His punish windows are so big that you need to be insanely greedy to get into too much trouble here. So for weapon number three, we're going to use the Dragon Communion Seal. To get it, head back right to the start of the game, to the Stranded Graveyard. Down the ramps, then up to the right to get to the room with the Banished Knight. Run in to aggro him as the chariot goes down, then run down into this first alcove to watch him get bullied for an early seal. To go with it, head to the Putrefied Ruins in Leonia, and down into the cellar for the two finger heirloom and because this will bring us above 15 faith we can head back to Fort Gale in Kaelid to grab flame grant me strength then back to the mistwood down the lift and into the black reach head along the Sifra river and up this pillar to take the teleporter on top to grab Marika's scar seal from under the waterfall And to get some cool spells to use with it, you can kill Grail with the trusty Morningstar and Bleed Grease from the setup. Now the Dragon Communion Seal is best used as a secondary weapon on an RL1 build, and you can probably guess which spell you'll be seeing later. However, you can actually use it as your main weapon in the early game if you fancy the challenge, or are saving smithing stones for later on. Unfortunately, this will fall off pretty heavily in the mid and late game. But I think it's really cool that you can do a niche build like this at RL1. Red Wolf advice. Um, be patient, passive, and pick your moments. He's far easier with fast weapons. So definitely don't fight him with a very slow dragon communion incantation. And sometimes he'll do that insanely annoying thing where he jumps and casts simultaneously and one-shots you. Happily, he has very little health, so he's never really a problem, even at level 1. For weapon number 4, we're back to Castle Morn for laying in Misbegotten. The Grafted Greatsword is a really solid early game somber weapon. It's really strong in the early to mid game, and it drops off a bit after that so it's the perfect choice to grab early for some of the later game builds I'll be showing you. Although it has a hefty strength requirement, we can two-hand it with the Saw Seal and the Strength Physic. This does mean we only have three minutes to use it, but that's not a problem in the early to mid game. Phase 2 Renala can be a bit of a problem at RL1. If you're not careful, the shotgun attack and Comet Azure are instant death. But as long as you avoid these, you should be fine. Be patient when she summons. Run away from the Bloodhound Knight, but make sure you capitalise on the dragon. His initial breath attack will go straight over you while you attack her in safety. For weapon number five, we head to the Outer's Plateau, to the Road of Iniquity. Whack the troll to stop the carriage, and grab the spiky bonk. Which of course works amazingly with the Cragblade Ash of War. You can grab this from the Scarab near the entrance to Redmain Castle. Great Stars is also much lighter than you might expect, so you can pair it with the Blue Dancer Charm. You can get this by killing the Golem, in the High Road Cave in Limgrave. And for a lot of strength weapons at RL1, you'll also want to head to Fort Gale to pick up the Star Scourge heirloom from the chest on top. So Godskin Noble. 
And this might be the first time in your RL1 run where that death counter really starts creeping up. Most of his attacks will one-shot you, so you have to be careful. Phase 1 is mostly fine. Where this fight gets sketchy is Phase 2. I always try to hit Noble straight after his transition. If you get a hit in straight away, he'll hold back on the rolling attack and go for the far more punishable slam. Because of the length of this fight, you're unfortunately probably going to get the rolling attack at some point, so make sure you stick close to the pillars for that easy dodge. The other good news here is that that ridiculously fast belly explosion isn't a one-shot. If it was, this fight would be far harder. So the reason it's a good idea to do Noble as early as possible is for the Sombre 7 locked behind the fight. So head down through the manor, grabbing the Dagger Talisman if you need it, and pick up the Sombre 7 by the Abductor. Now for Rykard, and the weapon we're going to use here is the Lance. Yeah, I know, it's not a build for the whole game, but the Serpent Hunter might be the best RL1 weapon in the game, and rather than wasting it on a boring fight like Rykard, I want to show you its true posture-breaking potential against one of the more interesting bosses, maybe Plassey or Elden Beast or something. Rykard is the first fight on the run where every single attack is a one-shot. The Power Stance speedrun strat is by far the easiest way to kill Rykard on RR1. If you want to make life even easier for yourself, you can take the Serpent Hunter straight to EG and upgrade it to plus four. But what you're seeing here is plus zero. Now for something that I never bother to do on a standard playthrough but you should definitely consider at RL1. Head to the Rose Church in Leonia to speak to Vare, then do his three invasions to gain access to Mogwin's palace early. Doing this means that after dying to these lot 20 times in a row, we can grab the ancient Somber Stone for a plus 10 weapon. So from this point on, all Somber weapons will be max level. And this is definitely something to consider for your RL1 playthrough. Bearing in mind that getting a smithing stone weapon to max level only really becomes possible after Godskin Duo, getting a max Somber before the capital means that a Somber weapon is definitely a wise choice for the mid game at RL1. For one such weapon, you can head down into the Gelmir Hero's Grave to get utterly memed by skeletons and chariots for build number six, the Ringed Finger. Hammers are super solid for RL1, so I thought I'd show you a few options through this capital section. The Ringed Finger is a particularly good choice, as it's available from the start of the game, and it's somber. It's even worth grabbing this early and upgrading it to plus four at EG, just to use it to get some of the weapons that I'll be showing you later on. The Draconic Tree Sentinel in Altus is another boss where we can't afford to get hit at RL1. Because of this, I'd highly recommend the parrying approach, as you can almost get a stun lock with most strength based weapons here. For our next build, we're going to head through Lanedale and into the true round table hold to grab the hammer from the blacksmith's location. This is a great shout if you want a fast, blunt damage smithing weapon for the late game. Godfrey isn't too bad on R01. We can't get hit, but his moveset is predictable enough to not be too much of a problem. As always, just stick to quick attacks in between these combos and you'll be fine regardless of your build. Now 
able to answer a question. What's the upside to getting one shot by absolutely everything? Well, if you're alive, you're probably at full health. So at some point on your playthrough, you definitely want to head into the Lux Ruins to kill the Demi-Human Queen for the Ritual Sword Talisman. Now, if it's your first time doing an RL1 run, you may be surprised how relatively smoothly it's gone up until this point. But here's the fight that's going to change that. Morgoth. Morgoth's moveset, combined with his ability to one-shot us, is an absolute nightmare. Ideally, you want to walk in here with a max level somber. But to show you the worst case scenario, I did this with a smithing weapon. One that I've used in every single build guide, yet never fought a boss with. The good old grail killing Morningstar. The Morningstar is possibly the ultimate hammer for R01. It's a club on steroids. Higher base damage, higher posture damage, thanks to the returning Cragblade infusion, and it has bleed. When I was first thinking of doing a traditional R01 build guide, the Morningstar and a certain dagger were my original picks. For Morgoth at R01, I'd actually recommend parrying, despite my continuing belief that he's the hardest boss in the game to parry. It just allows you to control the fight so much more. Trying to trade with Morgoth, even with a fast weapon like this, is a nightmare because of how easy it is to get tagged by any of those super quick combos. Your general strategy should be to build enough posture damage to stun him out of the dagger attack early. Then get him to phase 2 with a riposte and a charged attack afterwards. For phase 2, you want to capitalise on those big openings after his blood attacks to inflict the majority of your damage safely. Do watch out for the floor though, those explosions are a one shot as well. Now our next weapon is one of the first big hitters, and one that should be near the top of your list for a first RL1 run, the Dragon's Halberd. To get it, head down into Seafra River and fight the Dragonkin Soldier. You can get this build set up as soon as you're ready to beat this guy. If you wanted to get it right at the start of the game, you could pump up the club to plus 16 and fight him before anything else. Or do the first few bosses for a few more talisman pouches if you feel underpowered. Because of this weapon's weight, you're better off swapping out the Blue Dancer Charm for the Two Finger Heirloom and using Flame Grant Me Strength. The Dragon's Halberd is very, very good. The Frost and the Lightning from the Ash of War chunk damage, even at R01. Might have to do a build guide for this one soon to see what it's capable of on a normal run. For Adan at rune level 1, you can fight him whenever you like. If you leave him till this point, with a max level Somber, on quite a few weapons, you can effectively stunlock him through all of his scripted moves. If you fancy a bit more of a scrap, you can of course fight him earlier. For build number 11, we'll use a fan favourite, the Greatsword. You can get it from the back of this carriage, just east of the Minor Erdtree. Now if you know your weapon requirements, you might not think that we can use this one at RL1. Because of the 31 strength requirement, and the fact that we've now reached the point in the game where the fights can creep above the 3 minute mark, meaning that we can't rely on the physic either. But we can use it. First head to the forest just north of Castle Morn in Weeping and kill this scarab 
for the poison mist ash of war. Then up to the windmill heights in Altus, and west along the road to the mage on the hill. Sneak up behind him and poison mist him for the battle mage set. This mask gives us the extra point in strength we need to two-hand the greatsword without the physic. I also drop back to Rhea Lucaria to grab the glintstone wet blade to give it a cold infusion with crack blade. Cold infusion isn't what you want for this weapon, go for heavy, but I thought I'd see how it is for fire giant. And even without the extra scaling, it does monstrous damage. You can use this setup right after killing Margit at the start of the game. All you need is Radagon Source Heal and the Star Scourge Heirloom. So RL1 Fire Giant. He's super annoying, but phase one is pretty straightforward. Just go for the feet and dodge the attacks. The best advice for phase two is to play very passively and wait for super safe opportunities. Make sure you always have Torrent on hand for three attacks. I like to trigger the fireballs as soon as he casts them. Jump straight on Torrent the moment you see him start that big spinning breath attack and summon him as soon as he starts shooting the two projectiles. These are usually fine to roll on a casual playthrough, but when you're four minutes into an RL1 fight, it's better to be safe than sorry. Now it's time for another big hitter. Head all the way back to the very start of the game to kill the Tree Sentinel for the Golden Halberd. The Golden Halberd is perhaps one of the most powerful weapons you can use in the early game. You can wield it right at the start with the strength and Faith Knock Tears, along with Radagon's Sword Seal. While its split holy damage means it falls off a little later in the game, it's still incredibly strong, and there's many worse weapons you could choose for a full RL1 playthrough. So Rune Level 1 Duo. The way I see it, there's two options that don't involve a whole lot of suffering. You can go for the Sleep Cheese, or do an incredibly tedious RNG fest parry fight with a smaller weapon. I felt no guilt at all in choosing the former here. With Duo dead, we can now easily start levelling up those smithing stone weapons to max. The ancient dragon smithing stone in the giant skull in the mountain tops is the easiest one to get. Now for an old souls classic, the Zwei Hander. You can grab this from the merchant in the west of Weeping Peninsula. And for an ash of war to go with it, we're going to head back to Fort Gale in Caelid to fight the angry cat for Lion's Claw. Lion's Claw is a great addition to the Zweihander and other colossal swords and hammers, as what it gives you is effectively a charged R2, but one that comes out at twice the speed. If you look at this footage of me fighting Astol, a boss who you really don't want to be fighting with a slow weapon on R01, you'll see that I'm just a hair away from getting caught by those attacks when I'm using charged R2s. Using Lion's Claw, however, I can get almost the same damage in, but much more safely. You can also see here that I picked up a bunch of Kukris with my spare runes to chuck in certain fights. This is a really good strat for keeping up posture damage with an enemy who moves away from you a lot. For Astol at RL1, the general advice is to use a quick weapon, and definitely watch out for the quadruple slam, as this is near impossible to dodge. Speaking of Dark Souls swords and Lion's Claw, head back to Castle Morn and hug the right wall as you run past all of the corpses, into this room to grab the claymore. A 
at this point you can also complete Alexander's questline for another really useful RL1 talisman, the Shard of Alexander. As has been the case in pretty much every Souls game, the Claymore is just a solid, reliable weapon. And while Lion's Claw on the Zweihander dealt less posture damage than its charged R2, on the Claymore it does more than the standard charge. If you want a traditional no-nonsense Souls melee build for your RL1 playthrough, the Claymore should be at the very top of your list. While it isn't particularly flashy in any area, it's absolutely solid in all of them. Beast Clergyman and Malaketh on RL1 is very build dependent. For bigger weapons like the Great Sword or the Golden Halberd or Serpent Hunter, it's significantly easier. You can use jumping R2s to punish beasts attacks and that health bar will disappear very quickly along with a stagger and a riposte doing a massive chunk along the way. If you're using something smaller, I find it best to play far more passively, doing it slowly but surely, going for R1s between these attacks and a chargey for that long sweeping attack. The same is true for Malika. Big weapons will get this fight over and done with quite quickly and with far less to worry about. Regardless, you should still go for charged attacks even with small weapons. The amount that you can sneak in during that slow one too mean you'll likely get a stagger along the way even with the small stuff. So into the Ashen Capital, into the late game. And this is the point where the fights really go up a notch. But so does the satisfaction. From here on in, we have the good bosses. This is the point where RL1 Elden Ring becomes really fun. Fuck, I forgot about Gideon. Well, it was a nice idea, I guess. The Serpent Hunter might be the best RL1 weapon in the game, and rather than wasting it on a boring fight like Rykard, I want to show you its true posture breaking potential against one of the more interesting bosses, maybe Plassey or Elden Beast or something. For RL1 Gideon, the key is just not letting him attack. Keep right on him and hit him with a single R1 when he's still. You'll have to dodge a couple of Karian retaliations, but outside that, you'll be okay. Serpent Hunter is awesome. Even with its charged R2 being nerfed recently, it's still probably the best strength weapon you can use at this level. And it makes most of the bosses so much easier than the other weapons that you've seen today. The only requirement for it is killing Godskin Noble. For our next build, we're gonna head back to the mountain tops and towards the Church of Repose. Go stand by the cliff and wait for the invader to yeet himself off. Toss aside the dull and unremarkable weapon he drops, then travel back to Limgrave, to Argyll Lake South, to grab another ridiculously good pick for RL1, Bloodhound's Fang. And this might be the easiest setup there is for an RL1 playthrough. Kill the Bloodhound Knight at the very start of the run, then use Bloodhound's Fang for the early and mid game with the dex and strength physics giving us the stats. As I said before though, that three minute limit is fine for the early game, but will become a problem from Fire Giant onwards. Happily, that's the point 
where you can kill the guy with the silly sword and use his mask to wield Bloodhound's Fang without the physic. Now you might be wondering why I haven't headed towards any dex talismans for this playthrough. And the reason is that they're locked behind Commander O'Neill. And while O'Neill is usually trivial on a casual playthrough, on RL1, him and the gank squad are genuinely more annoying than most of the late game. So I didn't do that for any of these builds to save you some avoidable suffering. For Godfrey Horalu, RL1 really doesn't feel all that different to casual Godfrey in terms of difficulty. If you know the moveset, you're fine. If you don't, he's pretty good at double tapping you at level 100 anyway. And Horalu dishes out one shots even for late game builds. So you're not really going to notice a massive difference. The biggest determining factor for difficulty here is your weapon. While using the same strats as the earlier Godfrey, going for quick attacks between combos, the bigger stuff will allow you to build up enough posture damage to do the flashy stagger strats on Horalu that you normally see on this channel, dealing enough damage through charged attacks and riposts for an almost scripted fight. For smaller weapons, you'll have to play a lot more passively through Phase 2 and have a better grasp of Horalu's moveset. Now despite RL1 heavily favouring strength builds, I wanted to make at least a couple of dex options for the late game. Status effects are unaffected by our level, so they're a natural choice for RL1. I headed to the Shaded Castle and round to the left to kill Malay Marai for the Antspur Rapier. Now without killing Commander O'Neill, we can only use this weapon for 3 minutes with the dex not tier but three minutes is more than enough time to do some serious damage and get in some Scarlet Rot procs. For a good setup, you can head into Nokron and kill the Mimic for the Mimic Tear Mask. This setup works great when dual wielding, so I also grabbed the S-Stock from the Merchant in Liurnia. Then you can head to the Freezing Lake Grace and down onto the lake to kill this Scarab for the Seppuku Ash of War. Then get the Lost Ashes of War from the Merchant in West of Weeping and duplicate seppuku at the round table for a dual bleed setup with Scarlet Rock. And I also grabbed a rapier and infused it with poison to swap to after the ant spur stops working, but perhaps that's a tad over-engineered. Finally, kill the Erdtree avatar in Kaelid for the bubble tier. This physic allows you to tank one hit, so it's a good choice for any build that relies on surviving through long fights like this one. And this is also the point where I brought back the Dragon Communion Seal for Poison Mist and Rock Breath. For any build where you're using the Two Finger Heirloom, Rock Breath is a no-brainer. So RL1 Plassey. For fuck's sake, don't use this build on him. This was a really long fight. Strength weapons with big posture damage will make this a whole lot easier. The secret to Plassey is always dodging to your right for his melee attacks, especially for the attacks that come from the left. These make you want to roll into them, but it's really easy to get tagged by that lingering hitbox if you do. You'll be absolutely fine, however, if you roll to the right. If you're an absolute beast with the timing, 
you can get stuck in through the lightning storm attacks. But for long RL1 fights, I was far more cautious than usual. Now from an over-engineered status effect build to a very simple but extremely powerful one. For this, I headed back to the Church of Inhibition in Weeping to do something that I've never done on this channel before. Farming. This skeleton chap in the graveyard outside drops the Bandit's Curve Sword, an incredibly powerful weapon for inflicting status effects. The drop rate according to the wiki is utterly depressing, but I got one within 10 minutes. And instead of doing what I did and farming for a second, you can head up to Mount Gelmir and grab the Scavenger's Curve Sword. Infuse both of these with seppuku and you have an utterly monstrous bleed build. You could use this build right from the start of the game by grabbing the Blood Blade Ash of War until you get to the mountain tops. For Moog, we're going to first go kill Eleonora for the Purifying Tear. Now this build is possibly a slight breaking of my don't use the perfect weapon for the boss rule. While I'm not sure it's the best setup in this video for Moog, this build is ridiculously strong for him. For these weapons, it's just jumping attacks for fast procs. While this build is great for bleedable bosses, it will involve a little more suffering on the ones that can't be. But if you're willing to trade an awful Elden Beast for an easy Moog and Melania, this might be the one for you. For RL1 Moog, I definitely recommend the Bubble Tier for Phase 2, if you're not the best Floor is Lava player. If you can get away with using the Faith Talisman on your build, you can get a full Rock Breath off through Knee Hill, which will do most of the heavy lifting in his Manic Phase 2. For our next weapon, we'll head back to Limgrave and into Argyll Lake to kill Neregis for the Reduvia. The Reduvia is a solid weapon even with the lack of buffs available. If you wanted to kill Commander O'Neill and Esgar in the subterranean shunning grounds, this would be even better. But it's still pretty strong even without those talismans. Once again, the Mimic Tear Mask for the extra arcane is highly recommended. So Commander Niall at RL1. For anyone who's seen my guides before, you already know that I'm going to suggest the parry strategy here, almost regardless of the weapon. However, while trying to come up with something a little fresh here, I accidentally discovered a really good RL1 cheese strategy for Niall using the Reduvia. If you dodge the electric foot attack, then hit a blood blade attack just outside his melee range, then back off, you can get him caught in a little loop. The Reduvia is max level here, but the main source of damage is the bleed. So you could easily upgrade a Reduvia to plus four and do this if Nia was annoying you at RL1.
For Loretta, we're going to head back to Limgrave for another great option for the whole playthrough. Into the death-touched catacombs for the Uchi. Now the obvious play for this weapon is all of the dex buffs and spam unsheath on everything. But hear me out. Heavy infusion with crag blade. And if you're not immediately convinced by that, just watch this. Loretta can actually be a bit of a nightmare at RL1. In fact, in my first RL1 run of Elden Ring last year, she was actually the boss that took me the longest due to her annoying tendency to occasionally combine melee and magic in a way that is completely undodgeable. Parries combined with a big weapon and charged attacks minimise this a lot though. If you can manage to get her stuck against a wall, as I do here, you can chain charges and keep her stunned for most of the fight. For lighter weapons, you want to play far more passively and wait for those big blue combos to get in most of your damage safely. For the penultimate boss of this run, we head back to the Ball Prawn Shack in Leonia. For what I've previously said is the best weapon in Elden Ring, the Iron Balls. I did think of using the Starfist separately on this run, but I didn't want to make life too easy for myself. They're very similar in terms of damage. And for anyone who doubted the potency of the balls, just behold the damage here. I've done nearly 30 overpowered build guides on New Game, and only half a dozen of them bullied Radagon as much as these things do at rune level 1. They're insane. Big weapons are great for Radagon. Despite how manic his moveset is, he does give you plenty of opportunities for charges in his cooldowns. For smaller weapons, a more intimate knowledge of his moveset and a whole lot of patience is required. And Elden Beast. Once again you can see that the Iron Balls absolutely demolish his health and posture. And Elden Beast is slow and predictable enough to be pretty easy even at RL1. Apart from that one attack that you're all currently wondering about, Elden Stars. Now. I actually don't have a good recommendation for it. The Crimson World Bubble Tier is the safest and most consistent method for avoiding it. But that means doing the rest of the fight with lower damage, which isn't ideal. With the nerfs to Light Rolls and Bloodhound Step, I'm yet to find a completely consistent way of dodging it. In my standard runs, I always run straight under his left arm and keep sprinting forward. This works the majority of the time, but it can fail for no reason, or not work if he casts by one of the invisible walls. The one method that does work is dealing enough damage and posture damage to stun him out of it and kill him before he can do it. To my knowledge, the weapons capable of this at RL1 are the Balls, the Star Fists, Bloodhound's Fang, and the Serpent Hunter although I suspect that the Dragon's Halberd and Greatsword would do the job as well. So if I haven't made it clear enough already, I'd highly recommend one of these weapons for the late game at RL1.
And finally, the ultimate From Software challenge. The hardest boss they've ever created at level one. If you're a regular viewer of my channel, it will come as no surprise that for the final build, I headed back to Stormvale through the Stone Sword Key Gate to get my character her weapon. The Misericord is a powerful choice for R01, as long as you have your parry timings down. It's available straight after Margit, and for most of the game, I'd pair it with a Bleed Infusion and dual wield it with Reduvia for non parryable bosses. So, Melania. How hard is an R01 parry fight with Melania if you're already super comfortable with her parry timings? and pretty consistent with waterfowl and clone attack dodges. Well, this fight took me longer than the whole run had up to this point. And it certainly didn't help that the first time I beat her, I realized that I hadn't hit the record button on OBS, so I had to do it twice. Tips for Melania at RL1. First off, if you're not using parrying, I'd highly recommend checking out Gino's tutorial on beating her at RL1. It's an incredibly comprehensive guide on dodging and punishing all of her attacks. For a parry strategy, you obviously need to be super comfortable parrying all of her attacks consistently. After that, you need to get very comfortable with either the incredibly precise 360 redirect waterfowl dodge or the slightly more approachable triple light roll dodge I'm doing here. The reason these are so important is that they're the only two methods to my knowledge of dodging waterfowl at point blank range now. And the key to this fight for parrying at RL1 is to stay as close as you can. The thing that kept getting me killed in this fight wasn't waterfowl or miss parries, it was being just slightly too far away to get the parry connection sometimes. The other thing that made my attempts way more consistent was waiting for Melania to reset to idle after a riposte, before approaching her. If she's rotating around when you approach, she can do a spinning attack that dead angles straight through your parry. So never try to attack her at an angle. The physics tier I'd recommend for this fight is the bubble tier. And I only use this for the far more dangerous phase two. For phase two, stick as close as you can to her. If you stay right on her for the whole fight, she will never do the clone attack. You're very likely to get it at some point unless you stay absolutely glued to her, but you'll see it far less this way. I'll leave a link in the description to the full seven minute fight for anyone who wishes to study the positioning or the dodges. And that's it, 22 ways to beat Elden Ring at RL1. Sorry for the long video and all the talking. I'll be back with my traditional build guide shenanigans very soon. As always, thanks for watching.